Dan Sullivan's a man of deep commitments, as David Brooks was just talking about. Um, when they uh, lived abroad for a couple of years, when they moved back to Evansville, the Sullivans decided intentionally to move into a diverse neighborhood and to really try hard at being good neighbors. And uh, so his talk tonight is going to be exploring that idea and what it takes to be a good neighbor, uh, what it takes to maybe form relationships with people who don't think like you or maybe look like you or have different experiences in life. And so, Dan, without giving much more away, would you come and present for us, guys? Welcome, Dan Sullivan. Thank you very much. In 1948, my grandpa bought a house. It was up on Maryland Street Hill by Helfrick School, and it cost $1,100. So he goes to the bank to get his mortgage. The bank looks at his neighborhood, and there are three African-American families that live on his block. And the bank saw that as a liability, and it actually devalued his home. And so they said, you can move there if you want to, but we're going to take $100 off of what we would normally loan you for each one of those families. Think that through. $800 instead of $1,100. And so he did not buy into what those bankers thought. He did not buy into their practice. And he said, I'm going to count the cost, pay extra. I'm going to go around to my, my friends, my family. I'm going to scrape up $300, which think that through. That's a lot of money. That's like almost a fourth of his house, right? And got that money together and he paid it. Let's see how this goes. Maybe. There it is. The house is still there. He lived there all the rest of his life for decades with his wife and a whole bunch of kids, raised them up into awesome adults, was friends with the neighbors, loved them. It was not a liability. It was a neighborhood. Let me tell you about my grandma. My grandma worked in an office doing a job that, you know, one of those jobs that's been replaced by our phones that they used to have in offices. She worked in there, and she had a co-worker that was an African-American, and they go on a little short business trip, And they go to a restaurant, and they're going in to eat. And her co-worker says, I'll meet you out at the car when we're done. And my grandma says, what are you talking about? And her co-worker says, well, this is a whites-only restaurant. I can't eat here. I have to go around to the back, get my food from the dishwasher. He'll bring it out to me, and I'll pay for it, and I'll eat on the back step. So when you're done, I'm, I'm done. We'll just meet back out here at the car. My grandma, not an activist, not a radical, just a totally normal, sweet lady, says, no way, you're equal. We're going to do this. So she marches in. This is like in the 40s, you guys. This is not civil rights movement stuff. This is in Terre Haute, Indiana, too. They go into the restaurant, and they sit there. Waitress doesn't stop. Waitress doesn't look at them. It gets awkward. Finally, she says, hey, we're paying customers. You're going to serve us just like everybody else. Give us some food. And so they ate. Now, my grandma and grandpa, like I said, they weren't activists. They weren't, like, marching. They weren't any of this business. They just thought African-American people were just like them. No big deal. But when they raised up those daughters, and they became teenagers, daughters became teenagers, and it was time to go to a school dance at the C.K. Newsom Community Center, they weren't allowed to go. Why do you think that was? is because my grandparents were prejudiced. Not the way you might think. They weren't allowed to go to the C.K. Newsom Community Center because there would be non-Catholics there. (laughs) Not Protestants, non-Catholics. Not unchurched people, non-Catholics. And so they weren't allowed to go to the dance. See, isn't that funny? Like, one of these was totally fine, no big deal. The other one, no way. Not happening. See, the truth is, we learn and we choose what we divide. We get taught it, and then we make a choice. Do I want to hold on to what I've been taught, or do I want to let go of it? We lived a couple years overseas, and it was some of the formative years of our kids' lives, and we had all kinds of friends. You guys, we had friends from every continent except Antarctica. And I don't know if anybody's from Antarctica, but... They were all different kinds of people. They were Australians. They were Europeans. They were Asians. They were, they were North Africans. They were South Africans. They were Central Africans. They were South Americans all over. And so if we introduced 
a language to our kids of black and white, it would have been really confusing, right? I mean, think that through for a minute. That doesn't really make sense, does it? See, we became friends with so many kinds of people, and our friends were so variegated. It's a word of the night for you. That, that they didn't use those kinds of words to refer to their friends. When we moved back to Evansville, they referred to kids by their shirts. They referred to other kids by how long their hair was or if they were good at basketball. And black and white got learned when we came back. We still don't really hold on to it. We learn stuff and we choose what we're going to hold on to, what we're going to stick with. Now, if we're Christians... We only have one tribe. We're Christians. And it's the body of Christ. And guess what? I'm about ready to blow your houses a little bit bigger. Jesus himself said not to judge who's in and who's out. Paul says in the book of Romans, don't say who's going to heaven and who's going to hell because you bring Christ down. So if Christians only have one tribe, our tribe has got a whole lot bigger with those two verses didn't it? Because I'm not the doorman. All right, hold on. Let's blow it up bigger. In Isaiah 54, it says, enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch your tent curtains wide. Don't hold back. Lengthen your cords. Strengthen your stakes. It's talking about your tent. What does this mean? Okay, ancient Hebrew culture. Your tent was your domicile, like a uh, man's home is his castle kind of thing. Man's home is his tent. Make your tent big. Extend your ropes. Put your stakes out front. You had to put your stakes in really, really hard if your, if your tent was really big. And God says through Isaiah, make your tent big. I want people from all different nations. I want all kinds of people under my tent. Bring them in. What's right in the middle? Do not hold back. What do I do when I see the drug dealer walking down my street? I get scared and I hold back. But God says, do not hold back. What do I see when I have a friend that smells so bad with BO that when I eat, I taste the BO? Do not hold back. Do not hold back. Extend it. God wants so many different kinds of people under his tent. He says, go for it, folks. Make friends with all kinds of people. Do it deliberately with mercy. you got to have mercy because people are not ready for you to be their friends. Okay? They are going to get freaked out. So we have a farm stand. We moved 4,000 pounds of vegetables this summer. And that means 4,000 pounds of conversations in our neighborhood. These really cool dudes are walking down the street one day, Saturday morning. And I see them, and I'm like, dude, I have to talk to those guys. I run up with some handful of cherry tomatoes. I say, you guys, have you ever tasted a straight-up cherry tomato that's only been picked for an hour? An hour ago, this was alive on a vine. No, that's all right. That's totally cool. Not going to have anything to do with me. I said, guys, I'm going to walk with you down the street (laughs) until you eat one of my tomatoes. They're that good. All three of these super cool, tough guys completely busted out laughing because they knew it was true. And they each took one, and they said, thanks, man. And they ate them, and they were delicious. Do you know, I don't have to strong-arm those guys next time they walk by because they know what they're in for. Spread. Do not hold back. Deliberately. This is not a warm and fuzzy message of unity and equality. Jesus who is not like me, befriended me. Look, you all know Philippians 2? Your relationships with one another. That's what it refers to. In your relationships with one another, don't consider yourself awesome, but be a servant. It is not just fun. It is not just entertaining. It is not just a warm, fuzzy thing. Seriously? It is a gift, a mandate, and a life of gratitude to extend those tent pegs. Thank you.